<laughs> Welcome everyone. Hello, good day, Aceway. Uh, I'm Leslie Bonshore. I am so pleased to be able to open up today with my colleague Janice Wardrop, the Director of Indigenous Cultural Safety here at Vancouver Coastal Health. Welcome to the second annual virtual Indigenous Cultural Safety Summit. We're going to start off the day. We're so fortunate to have our beautiful relatives from the Squamish Nation here to start us off. We have um, Sa'a'ala Ala and his family here to sh um, share with us a welcome and the Eagle Song Dancers. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to add a little bit more after they've blessed our day with their beautiful songs and dance. Haichka Osiem, thank you very much. Osiem, Haichka. It is our honor, our pleasure to welcome you here today on behalf of the family doing um, a little bit of a workshop and we would like to uh, continue with uh, a bit of our protocol. That first song is a way of addressing um, some of our chiak, our protocol, by introducing our canoe and uh, the purpose of which we are here with you today, which is all in a good way, a peaceful, peaceful gesture. And um, the next song we'd like to do is a blessing song, comes from one of our lady ancestors uh, who had a little difficulty getting around, but when the families got up and sang for her, she was able to transcend uh, her difficulties and she was able to dance. And uh, so that medicine with this song is all about uh, transition, is all about making it from one good place to another good place without having any mishaps or, you know, by getting there successfully. Song is known as Tum Tum Sloan or Snowbird. Not the Anne Murray version, the other one. Okay. Whoa. Whoa.
hunt. So our protocol requires us to, to set the stage, to kind of set the table. And when we um, do our songs of prayer, we have to have some way of uh, allowing that to reach the creator. So we use the spakos to do that. The eagle, which will bring our prayers to those high places above the clouds. That was a hint. <laughs> and uh, we would like to ask Spockwos to speak to the Creator, to speak to the ancestors on our behalf, to let them know that uh, we are very happy with the way things are and would like to um, move forward a little bit taking care of our families, asking the Creator and the ancestors to hear our prayers. Escucta Spakos is the title of the song. It uh, translates to eagles gathering together. As they gather together, they are very similar in uh, personalities and characters in that when they get together, they, they behave a lot like human beings. They share information. They uh, talk about uh, where they've been, share their stories, and uh, they look for a partner in life. Um, so the eagles, when they come together, they um, they resemble a lot of uh, our human traits. So we can uh, relate to them, and sometimes we adopt their spirit in order to to find ourselves in a better place. To see what we need to do. So Escucha Spacos, the gathering of eagles, is this next uh, this next song. <clears throat> We would like to continue with paying tribute to the spirit of family, to the spirit of the warrior, 
the spirit of leadership. And also to share a little bit of history. The, the next song is Takaya Slow, and it is in uh, reference to the wolf. And uh, this particular presentation uh, identifies one of our families in Squamish that uh, are the wolf clan and their story goes back to a small boy that was found living with wolves. And that small boy was discovered up along the uh, Chakamas River and was um, taken from there from the wolves uh, who, was in who he's in company with. And um, they brought the boy back down to the longhouse by Chakamas, Chikai. And uh, from there, uh, they had uh, kept the wolves away. The wolves uh, laid siege to those longhouses there, but they were waited out. And uh, they had patience enough and enough preparation to allow the wolves to just uh, get frustrated with trying to get the boy. And, um, eventually the boy became part of our family. And after years went by, he had uh, developed into a fine warrior and uh, a leader, someone that everyone looked up to and looked to for advice. And as time went by, his family grew. And <clears throat> during his uh, grandfather years, war came. And uh, they came from the north in a great number of canoes. And there were the people who were concerned. So they had asked the grandfather for his advice. He gave good advice, but he asked for one small favor, that he be allowed to fight as well. So they set up their line of defense along the, uh, the waterfront, along the tree line, and uh, waited for the enemy to arrive. So they came. Hundreds of canoes came, but they didn't make it past the beach. They, they fought for five days. According to our oral history, uh, five days is what they tell us was the length of the battle. They were finally driven back to their canoes and uh, sent away. So the Squamish are on the beach going, yeah, you better run. That's how we roll. Yeah. So. Right. Anyway, um, so they had defeated the enemy and uh, because of the grandfather's advice and uh, they were concerned how the grandfather made out. They went to see how he was doing and uh, but he couldn't be found. All they, all they found was uh, the bodies of the slain enemy but nearby in the forest could be heard what sounded like celebration. Oh! oh! Grandfather, it is suspected, had the wolves helping him when he was defending the, uh, the beachfront there. And um, it is said that he went back to his first family. But this is the story of where the wolf clan comes from in the Squamish nation. And uh, the medicine that it provides is uh, the medicine of family, the medicine of uh, leadership, uh, the warrior spirit, and stepping up, stick up, stepping up to the plate, getting the job done. So that's the warrior spirit. And we attribute that to Takaya, the wolf, Osea. Everybody. Oh! 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 Oh, 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 oh,
We want to do uh, one more song, a prayer song that comes from, again, one of our lady ancestors who happened to reside over in that area in Stanley Park we call Papayak, um, between Papayak and uh, Waikoi, there is a, a small area that they call Lump, and uh, our lady ancestor, whose name was Sequoia, resided there during a time when the missionaries were first coming into the inlet, not wanting to cause any trouble or walk the boat as it were. She got in her canoe and paddled across to Hamalchtin, which is uh, one of our villages where we happen to reside. And um, during that little paddle, she started singing a song. That song we're gonna share with you today. It is known as Sekolia Slolum or Sekolia Song. It is also known as Greeting of the Day and is a song that we'll use in the mornings when, we, when we're greeting the day, when the sun is coming up and creation is starting all over again. Uh, we find those moments to be very special and we'll sing a song like this, Sekolia Slolum, to, to celebrate that. And sometimes we'll use this song for our morning baths when we are in the mountain streams in the morning to, to do uh, a bit of a ritual, a bit of a ceremony. This song helps us to stay focused and to keep ourselves in the water. So we share that with you as a way of uh, sh showing our gratitude for allowing us to be a part of your day, part of uh, your experience and uh, your workshops. So Anha Tamakutsi, Tekolia Smolo. Oh, 
Thank you so much the Eagle Song Dancers from the Squamish Nation for starting our day off in such a beautiful way. I appreciate the beautiful songs and the stories about this man, um, particularly the greeting of the day. What a wonderful way to start with Sequoia's song about the greeting of the day and the ceremony that went along with starting our days. Again, I want to welcome you to the first day of our second annual virtual summit. So pleased that you're able to join us. This uh, summit is called Leaping into Self-Reflection, Creating Ripples in Your ICS Journey. Uh, for those that don't know me, let me ground myself and call my ancestors into the room. Oh, I've got a message saying there's no sound. Sorry, testing, do I need to start over? <laughs> Okay, awesome. Somebody said yes, they can hear me. Great. Thank you. Um, just uh, wanting to introduce myself and ground myself into this beautiful day, into this beautiful work that we have such an honor and a good fortune to be able to deliver here at Vancouver Coastal Health. I'm Leslie Bonshore. First and foremost, I am Cicela, which means grandmother to Carson and Benson. When I wake up in the morning, that's who I am. I am mother to Carly, Clayton, and Riley, life partner to Mike, and I am an auntie and a sister and a friend. And I have the great privilege of holding the role and responsibility as Vice President of Indigenous Health here at Vancouver Coastal Health. I hold that honor with great privilege, knowing what it means to us as an organization, knowing what it means to other Indigenous people in this region who have for a very long time asked for leadership that represents our own people. I'm so honored to be in that role. And actually today I was reflecting on my drive in um, to work today that uh, six years ago, I started here at Vancouver Coastal Health. So um, just having real reflective morning on the journey that we've come through over the last um, six years, in particular the last year, which has been, um, Quite different for all of us the last year and a half. Again, I just uh, full of gratitude and opportunity and thanks to all of our ICS team who has put this summit together. It's no small task. I know it has been um, a challenge some days to make sure that we have everything we need to make this day happen. Um, just thank all of our team, the whole Indigenous Health team here at Vancouver Coastal Health for their good work. Today, most of us are here on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh in our office in East Vancouver. Um, we also have uh, many of our staff, and, and so many of you have already put in the chat box where you're calling in from. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for acknowledging the host territories in which you are conducting your work. We have 14 First Nations across Vancouver Coastal Region, each of them with their own unique um, cultures and, and songs like Swama shared with us today. Um, it's really important for us to each be on this journey of understanding not only um, the work and, and why cultural safety is so important, but also where are we grounded? Where are we located? We talk about our introductions and going through this process of who we are as, as grandmother, mother, um, auntie. I also want to acknowledge my uh, father, uh, the late Siamatol. And Siamatol is one of our oldest um, Stalo names. And my mother, uh, Lorraine, who is from the Tomarelli family, so Italian on my other side. I am from the Stalo Nation, one of 54 Coast Salish nations here in, in British Columbia. 
my village is called Shiacton, Shiacton First Nation out in Chilliwack. I was born and raised there. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather um, raised me for most of my life growing up. And when I speak of them, and when I call upon uh, my ancestors to stand with me today as I share with you, um, they come with me. And uh, another real good teaching of the day and to start the day by acknowledging the role that our ancestors play in our work, our knowledge. Some of the knowledge that was shared with you today has been passed down for generations and generations. And that is our way of telling stories, of bringing things forward uh, from the past to the present, and then what we're looking at in the future. What we're doing here with Indigenous Cultural Safety at Vancouver Coastal Health is really about bringing all of that from the past to make sure that in the future we have a system of healthcare uh, provided by all of you who work here at Vancouver Coastal Health, whichever part you play in caring for our population, that you're doing it from the place of understanding, of deep respect and understanding of the Indigenous population that we have the absolute privilege to serve. That's what it's all about. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you on behalf of this amazing Indigenous health team who come at this work with their full heart, um, connecting their mind and their heart to this work, which we call not so much. So thank you again uh, for all of you for joining. Thank you for acknowledging where you're calling in from. I have the next part of the agenda to kick off today. Um, I get to sit in a round table with my two colleagues, the other aunties, uh, those of you that have uh, tuned into our auntie circle in the past, uh, Miranda Kelly and Brittany Bingham will join um, me in a talk to kick off the first uh, round table of today's um, Cultural Safety Summit. And we will be talking about Indigenous women's health and Indigenous cultural safety and why they are so important to speak of together as your foundation um, to the rest of the summit. So please join me, Miranda and Brittany. Good morning, aunties. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Again, just transition really quickly from the opening comments to our very first session and give people a chance to um, adjust. Just want to really thank you for joining. I know this work can sometimes be difficult. Um, let's start off with our quick little circle of introductions. Again, Leslie Bonshore, I'm the privilege, I have the privilege of, of working with these two other aunties, and we'll describe more why we call ourselves aunties in these circles. Um, again, I am the, the granddaughter of Ethel Marie Fisher, and she is with me at all times, uh, taught me everything I needed to know about being a lady. That was one of her roles and also to be a, a caregiver and to be of good use, to always make sure that I was doing things for the greater good of others. Um, she was one that always had her back door open for everybody and fed everybody that needed food, um, clothed anybody that needed clothing. So I have her with me today and I'm privileged and honored to lead this conversation about Indigenous women's health and Indigenous cultural safety. Um, so let's go over to Miranda and then to Brittany to do an introduction and call your ancestors into this call as well. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Miranda Kelly. My ancestral name is Tilian. I'm Stalo from Sawali First Nation with ties to Cowichan, Sumas, and Sunamo First Nations on my dad's side and mixed settler ancestry on my mom's side. Um, born and raised out in Chilliwack, much like Leslie, um, and have been privileged and honored to be living, working, playing, and birthing on the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh since 2009. 
Um, I've been working in Indigenous health for many, many years now, um, joined Vancouver Coastal Health as the Director of Indigenous Women and Family Health in February. And prior to that, I was working as a doula and childbirth educator, serving Indigenous families around the Vancouver area. Um, and I credit my own children for taking me on this path to um, work in support and service to Indigenous communities and especially Indigenous women and families. Thanks, I'll hand it over to Brittany. Hi everyone, itakwikwi, tuk misiaya. My name is Brittany Bingham. I'm from the Seashell Nation on my dad's side, from the Dixon family, and I'm of mixed Norwegian, Irish, and Indigenous ancestry on my mom's side. I'm really grateful to call in from the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil -Waututh territories where I am so incredibly filled with gratitude to raise my children on these lands. Um, I am the Director of Indigenous Research here on Leslie's team at BCH, and that's a joint role with the Centre for Gender and Sexual Health Equity. I'm an Indigenous researcher and have been doing community-driven Indigenous research since about 2004. I'm very privileged and honoured to do this work um, and work towards amplifying Indigenous community voices in the research. Um, and translate findings to really inform system change. So very grateful to be here and part of the anti-circle again. So mm -hmm. thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I always feel so great, grateful to be able to, um, uh, Miranda and, and Brittany, to have you young ones um, use your language speak your own language um, as part of this work. I, I really honor you and thank you for, for learning and sharing. Um, Miranda, could you bring up that first slide? Um, we're gonna introduce this, this talk that we have and we have until 11.30. Uh, sometimes when we get talking, we run out of time. <laughs> this is... Um, an opportunity for us to really share with you with deep gratitude uh, why we focus on Indigenous women in so much of our work throughout our team. And I really thought that maybe we could start with this image. This image not only speaks to aunties, it speaks to grandmothers, it speaks to the moon, it speaks to uh, the culture. Um, I have this uh, on my uh, own back screen of, of my computer most of the time. Um, it just, it speaks such volumes to me. One of the ways we wanted to start our morning off with you was to talk about why, or what, what Indigenous cultural safety means to us as women. Us as Indigenous women healthcare providers and leaders in this work, but also as grandmothers, aunties, sisters, to all of our community as well. So we play this role that, you know, is with us all the time. I, I don't think I can emphasize that enough. I come at my work as a grandmother. I know Miranda comes to her work as a mom. Brittany comes to her work as a mom, but also as daughters of survivors, uh, daughters of women who before us um, ensured to protect all things um, from our culture as culture was passed down through the women, through the matriarchs. So um, instead of me starting off with, you know, my, my position on why women are so important to the Indigenous cultural safety work that we do, um, Miranda, I'm going to ask you to give us the, the start and not only just by this picture, but, you know, why uh, Indigenous cultural safety is so important to the women. Sure, thanks, Leslie. Um, so when we talk about Indigenous cultural safety, what comes to mind for me is feeling seen and feeling heard. And Leslie, I think about our Auntie Ginny out from Stalis. Um, I've had the privilege to work and learn with her for many years, and she always talks about that as non-Indigenous care providers, whether it's, it's health services, emergency services, um, funeral services, that she really wanted 
um, folks in the surrounding community to come and get to know the people of Stalis, get to know the people, sit with us, know who we are, see us, hear us. And that's what I carry with me um, when I think about Indigenous cultural safety is you enter into a healthcare setting and you feel seen and you feel heard, that the people there are there to care for you, that they see you, they see you as a human being, they wanna get to know you and to hear you. Um, I can give you a quick example of a, a, a scenario where someone did not feel uh, seen and heard. So as a doula, I was supporting a per, an indigenous person in labor um, and her, her doctor came in the room, um, still had the purse on her bag, phone, or a purse on her shoulder and phone in one hand, quickly said, hi, how's it going? Okay, I'll check in with you later and left the room. Um, and the, the client felt very unseen and, and, and kind of ignored. Like she just was like, she didn't even put her purse down. She, she didn't really connect with me. And I think what the client was looking for is that, you know, the care provider would come in, you know, put the things away, come sit down and have a conversation and really check in and, and hear how are things going. Um, and so, you know, that always stuck out in my mind as something that would have been fairly simple for the care provider in that scenario to change to, um, you know, put the purse and the phone away outside of the room somewhere where the client doesn't even see it. And then when you come in, you know, say hi, acknowledge you're coming into this space. It's a sacred space. This person is in labor. They're about to bring a life into this world. And they're working very hard to do that. So, you know, come sit down beside them, connect on that level eye level, you know, um, instead of kind of hovering at the end of the bed, but to come sit and be present. Um, even if you only have five or 10 minutes to connect, you can still connect in five to 10 minutes. Um, we've only just started this presentation and we're already connecting. So it is possible even in a short amount of time to make that connection. And I think that's where Indigenous cultural safety comes from is feeling that sense of connection. Um, and I would say that um, to offer a positive story <laughs> from my doula time, um, one of the times that I felt an immense sense of cultural safety in the room is when um, we had an indigenous client who was pregnant um, in an appointment with her midwife who was also indigenous. I was um, accompanying the client as her indigenous doula and she also brought along her uh, young daughter. So there was four indigenous women and, and a girl <laughs> in the room all together. Um, both care providers, myself the doula and the midwife were indigenous and um, the midwife was really engaging the, the older daughter in the process and letting her, you know, listen with the fetal monitor to find baby's heart rate. And it just felt like, um, wow, this is the kind of care that our women always had, um, having the safety of members of their own community providing that care. Um, and it felt like, you know, now this young Indigenous girl who is witnessing her mom receive care in this way is growing up understanding that that is the expectation. That's what she can expect growing up receiving health care is that she's going to be treated with that level of love and respect when she goes into that setting. So I will stop there and hand it over. <laughs> Great examples, Miranda. Very easy, right? That's the point we're trying to make that connection. We're very relational. So uh, that's what I got from what you just shared. It's about that relational connection it only takes a moment. Brittany? Thanks, Miranda, for such great examples. Um, yeah, when I look at this image or, you know, think back to our previous conversations around Indigenous women and cultural safety, I really think about um, this idea of collective care and how Indigenous women in communities are often caring for multiple families and other people's babies and offering support to each other in so many different ways, um, really upholding the foundation. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that we're working towards in this cultural safety work is for um, our people to receive treatment and care that's as if uh, their care provider is treating a member of their own family, 
that level of, of connection and relationality. Um, and also for, you know, something that I've heard in, that's really motivated me to get into this work many years ago was just a, a member of my family who had sought out care, an Indigenous woman, and, and simply left um, that care experience and said, this place is just not for me. And so that line has, has really, you know, resonated and stayed with me that um, we do want to create spaces where Indigenous women can enter our healthcare spaces and not leave feeling this is this place just is not for me. So that's something that's sort of near and dear to my heart about how um, some some small interaction like Miranda has explained can really lead somebody to leave care feeling like that, not feeling seen and heard, and the ripple impact that that has throughout that person's future care experiences, whether or not they choose to seek care later on in their life, but also this interconnectedness within communities that, you know, if one um, Indigenous woman has a poor experience like that, that will be shared within the community and that will be held in other people's memory as well. Um, and can also lead to fear for seeking care. Um, so that's really what it makes me think about. But I think our dream as a, as a system um, and as a, as a team is that really we, we hope to see a care system where Indigenous women can enter at any point in this healthcare system and really feel seen and heard. Um, and, and not just by other Indigenous people, there's obviously that immediate relational connection that we have with each other, but for everyone to really receive that care wherever they enter the system. So that's my thoughts. Thanks, Leslie. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, we've heard that and we heard it in uh, the response to In Plain Sight and the stories that came forward from women about not being seen, as Miranda mentioned, and then making comments like this place isn't for me and then um, not accessing care or delaying care. I wanted to share some uh, something that has stayed with me for, for years. And again, this picture just reminds me of the not so much. Not so much was something that, uh, again, when I started in October 2015, one of the things I really wanted to do was make sure that we had a mechanism in which to hear Indigenous women's voices throughout our system. And so we started um, in uh, September, or yeah, September 2016, a gathering in the downtown east side neighborhood called Not Samat, where Indigenous women from that community were invited in to spend the day with us to uh, connect with elders, have some culture, have some food and clothing. Many of our Vancouver Coastal Health uh, staff contributed by donating clothing to women. We hosted it in, in uh, downtown Inside Space. We had over 300 women come that very first day. They came in, they came out, they were lovely. Um, they shared, oh, Yes, thank you for sharing that, that diagram. So not Samat taught us. It was the very first one in 2016. We've had three or four, we've had four, I think, ever since then, and, and a delay in it um, because of COVID. But this was a, a safe space for Indigenous women to come and talk with Vancouver Coastal Health staff being our team, elders, and um, many of the service providers in the downtown east side to hear what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And we've made this a reciprocal relationship with dialogue based on storytelling, based on our matriarchal ways, our teachings that we have learned. Um, and, and it is a very unique way of engaging with the population that is usually hard to, to engage with or um, hard to get their story, uh, what they need. Um, but as Indigenous women leaders, we're able to have that conversation because we know it's over, it's around the kitchen table. It's over a cup of tea. It's while they're getting what they are missing, which is access to the culture, hearing their songs, seeing their aunties, having the matriarchs in, in the session with us. So, so this started us down a road to really elevating the voices of Indigenous women within our health system. 
And then in 2019, June 2019, Vancouver, the city of Vancouver hosted the Women Deliver. And this was an opportunity where we were going to have a global platform in which to share our stories. And I got involved, our team got involved, uh, along with our First Nations Health Authority partners. And we said, you know, it's all good to have something like this, but we need more. It can't just be a party. <laughs> it seemed to be a party for, for some pretty um, privileged people already. Uh, but anyway, so we, so we did. And we went ahead and we held our own day, a pre-conference day. Um, and together, uh, several Indigenous women from across BC got together and they created the Declaration. And the Declaration of Women Deliver the Natsmat, We Are One, Our Voices, Our Stories, Indigenous Women's Pre-Conference, um, validated and, and signed off on this declaration. And it keeps fueling the work that I've been doing and our team has been doing all along. And I thought maybe I could just read a bit of it because it really speaks to what we're asking of our Vancouver Coastal Health colleagues as well, and leaders. And speaking of leaders, I wanna welcome the whole senior executive team who has signed in today and, and has the virtual health, um, virtual summit as our senior executive team meeting today. So thank you for joining. Thank you, Vivian, for your amazing leadership. So the declaration states, this declaration is an acknowledgement of the resilience and strength of indigenous women in the face of systemic barriers, racism and marginalization that has been forced on all indigenous women worldwide. Through a year long engagement process, this declaration was created by incorporating the wisdom and experiences of indigenous women from various nations and lived experience. In this declaration, we are calling on our families our men, our leaders, our governments, and each other to use our collective power, influence, and energy to advance the rights of wellness of our women. We call on each other to honor and safeguard the givers of life and to create a better world for generations of Indigenous women and girls to come, because the wellness of women is the wellness of humankind. If you want to put up the other image, Miranda, yesterday, marked um, a national call to action on the inquiry into murder and missing Indigenous women and girls released in 2019, where there were um, 231 calls for justice. In Vancouver, people gathered at the City Hall, at the Art Gallery. I wasn't able to attend. I wish I could have, uh, but I definitely had um, all of the women that showed up in solidarity on my mind. The rest of the declaration goes on to say, we know Indigenous women are leaders and matriarchs who foresee a future in which the wellness of women is safeguarded and they are held sacred as the givers of life in our families, communities, and nations. Indigenous women acknowledge that the past colonialism and racism has attempted to take our power and key position in our communities and families. Indigenous women embody the teachings of our mothers, grandmothers, and ancestors and defy the colonial powers that have tried to dismantle our families, communities, and ways of being. Indigenous women support each other, hold each other up, and celebrate each other's achievements and wellness. Indigenous women respect and honor the wisdom of our elders and ensure their wisdom is carried through to our intentions and actions. Indigenous women nurture and teach the children, our leaders of tomorrow beyond just our own children and across generations of past, present and future. Indigenous women build for generations to come for, and all our actions consider their well-being and the well-being of Mother Earth. Indigenous women acknowledge diversity. Although we come from different communities, we come together to create these changes. It has been a while since I have read that but I don't need to read it every day. This speaks my truth. I know it speaks Miranda's and Brittany's truth. This is what we have been taught. We have been shown by our grandmothers and aunties and it is absolutely an honor to be considered an auntie and especially a grandmother. I think it's an important conversation that we have to have and I wanna keep breathing life into this declaration but someday it will become real 
that it will become something that we actually see and breathe more life into and form strategy around, right? We talked about collective care, Brittany. Thank you for bringing that language into our conversation. That collective care is what this speaks to about the role of women in our communities. And I know sometimes we get the question, well, what about the men, right? We love our men, we love our boys, our sons, our uncles, our grandfathers, of course we do. That whole declaration speaks to why the women, because they do, they're the foundation, they're the ones that care for everyone else. I wanna have more conversation about collective care collective care responsibility, that it takes a village, that there isn't just one child over here and that child is the responsibility of just that parent, that mother, the father, the grandmother. It is a collective. Do you wanna share a little bit more about that, uh, Brittany, as you've learned through our <laughs> collective research and discussions with many partners, why being a collective and collaborative is so important? Yeah, um, you know, if just reflecting on the day yesterday and these calls to justice and um, your declaration that was just read, you know, we've we've laid the foundation that our Indigenous women are the knowledge keepers, the life givers, the holders of knowledge. Um, yesterday we hosted a talk with uh, Abigail Echohawk, and one of the things she always says in her talks is. Um, you know, my ancestors survived so that we could thrive. So I think something to really deeply reflect on, which is something we collectively do um, as Indigenous women, is that this day of action yesterday is focused on uh, action and justice for 4,000 or more Indigenous women who have gone missing and murdered. Um, and what's often not talked about as much, I think, in these conversations is the actual impact that that has for communities as the translation of knowledge, the translation of tradition, this collective care of Indigenous women in communities, that 4,000 women have been lost in that intricate system that we operate in as Indigenous women. Um, and so I think that's something to reflect on in, in this focus of why we focus on women, why supporting women in this way is resistance to this colonial history that we are still grappling with today. It's not history, it's contemporary, it's happening right now. Um, and so, you know, I really see that as our key way forward. And I think that our, our whole team does that if we really support and uplift women, if we really work towards addressing these calls to justice and we put a stop to you know, further loss of that place in our communities, that place in our collective care of all of these women um, who have gone missing, uh, you know, that really is our way forward to rebuilding, resisting, resurgence for our communities, for future generations. So um, I just sort of want to put that forward as for everyone to really, you know, put in, it's not just a number to really think about um, each of those numbers as a, as a woman who's integral to our communities and to our families. And we see that every single day. We feel that with every fiber of our being, but um, often we just see it portrayed as numbers. And so we have to humanize that again and again. I agree, Brittany. Um, it is a demonstration of resistance. Thank you for using that word. Thank you for that little call to action there too, to go deeper, look past the number. Look past the number to the impact, the impact of 4,000 mothers, 4,000 life givers, aunties right, in our system, in our collective community. It's devastating, quite honestly. And, and often what I refer to is the devastating data, right? I, I want to live in a world where there, these devastating numbers aren't repeated over and over again. And that 
We're not hanging up red dresses to symbolize women who have gone missing and just keep that as such a, such a normal thing to see that, to see orange ribbons and think about one thing, to see red dresses and thinking about another. It's just, it, I don't want it to become so normal. Um, so we need to disrupt a bit. Miranda, collective care. Oh, I have so many thoughts swimming through my head right now, but I, I want to jump back to what you said, Leslie, about why do we focus on women so much? And I think it's really important to acknowledge that actually it was processes of colonization that decided to focus so much on Indigenous women. And it says right in the declaration that you read, Indigenous uh, women um, acknowledge that the past colonialism and racism has attempted to take our power and our key positions in our communities and families. And that that is true. The, the processes of colonization, the policies of colonization um, looked at our strong, thriving Indigenous societies and said, well, these women hold too much power and they're keeping these societies strong and well. So we will purposefully, intentionally create policies to disrupt how well women are supporting Indigenous societies. And so you see that in things like forced sterilization of Indigenous women. Um, the, under the Indian Act, women losing their status and any rights and privileges um, as being Indigenous. Um, and, you know, for me personally, the worst thing someone could ever do to me is threaten the safety and well-being of my children. And our children were taken away. You can imagine the devastation that that caused to all of the mothers, all of the aunties, all of the grannies in the community when children were taken away and continue to be taken away. So colonization did put the focus on Indigenous women. And that's why when we're attempting to decolonize, we also need to focus on Indigenous women and uplifting, empowering, and reversing all of that harm that was done through colonial processes and, and, um, and policies to restore the rightful place of Indigenous women in our societies as strong, as supporting um, health and well-being of not just themselves, but their whole communities. And, you know, I think we can really see um, how the ongoing impacts of co colonization are still present today in our healthcare system when you look at the findings of In Plain Sight. We know that colonization has harmed all Indigenous people, um, but that there were these you know, targets towards Indigenous women. And we see that reflected in, in Plain Sight findings when we see that, yes, anti-Indigenous racism exists across the whole healthcare system and does impact all Indigenous people, but Indigenous women and girls specifically are disproportionately impacted. So it does continue. And we do need to focus that emphasis on Indigenous women and girls because of the devastating data. Um, and so when it comes to collective care, I think that's part of restoring our power as Indigenous women is that we've always operated this way in this collective care model. And that's, you know, we're, we're rematriating, we're reclaiming that for ourselves and saying we deserve to do this once again, to provide this collective care for one another. Thank you so much, Miranda. Um, you know, it wasn't that many generations ago. Um, you know, my grandmother, myself even, as an Indigenous woman, um, I was no eligible for status when once I married a non-Indigenous man. Um, so that's within my generation, that those colonial rules were in place. And um, it was changed in the late uh, 90s, I think, um, certainly after my children were born, um, that I was able to, to apply for status. They changed that rule, um, but it's just crazy. And then how much uh, all of that is attached to this number. <laughs> I am number 575002450. Somehow that makes sense. I don't realize, I just don't understand that at all. But uh, um, again, thank you for bringing back that understanding of that collective, that interruption that happened, 
you know, through the colonial um, process. The Indian Act is, is one of the worst written documents with where it, it is the document in which patriarchy came alive in our communities because it wasn't there before. And, um, and that's, that's sad. So I often think about that when we talk about um, truth and reconciliation, and we talk about UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that whole Reconciliation Act is really about putting things back, right? Correcting things, making them reconcile to back to the way they were before. I wonder if we'll ever see that. <laughs> I wonder if um, the matriarch will have their place again. I hope so. I hope so. We talked a little bit about, again, bringing this back around to how cultural safety in our health system, what, did, what does it look like for, for Indigenous women and girls? What does, why does it matter? Right? We talk about the disparities, Brittany, the health disparities of Indigenous women versus all other populations, non-Indigenous women, Indigenous men. Doesn't matter which number, which data you look at, there are significant differences. We need to use that as our fuel going forward. But what can we tell our health uh, authority, our, our colleagues, our peers, on our call today, learning about what Indigenous cultural safety looks like um, for our women and girls. What's their number one action? What can we, what, what's our call to action for our group? Sorry, Brittany, I was tossing that over to you. Um, I was just looking over some some notes and points from our previous conversations because the aunties actually talk a lot not just not just on these big zooms but um one thing i had written down is uh constructive disruption uh and i think about that a lot in our work i think that uh i was reflecting the other day that it's been one year since joyce eshaquan has passed away um you know, and this calls for this calls for disruption. This calls for constructive disruption and collective disruption that I think, you know, we're acknowledging now um, collectively, all systems are starting to acknowledge now that the status quo isn't working well for our Indigenous women and our communities. Um, so we do need some disruption. We do need um, to challenge the status quo and change things and explore uh, new wise practices and innovative approaches and different ways that we can do things uh, from the Indigenous lens, from, from collective care, from community lens, uh, Indigenous women leading the charge on this. So I think my call to action is that um, that constructive disruption of the way we do things uh, and maybe not just thinking about it. Well, we do it that way because that's the way we've always done it. But instead to um, look forward at what can we do to better support Indigenous women and families coming from that relational place and coming from that place of, of treating our Indigenous patients as we would our own aunt or uncle or grandmother or grandfather and and that's that's really my thoughts on it Miranda yeah I was just thinking about what I do in my own work which is I try to just constantly all throughout the day in every meeting in every new piece of work to ask myself what would this mean to indigenous women how does this impact Indigenous women? So I want to offer that to all of you, that that's a question you can integrate into your day-to-day -day practice. Whatever you're doing, just pause and think, what would this mean to Indigenous women? How could this impact the health of Indigenous women? Um, and just become, 
you know, practice that, practice that as part of your, your daily work is, is to reflect. Um, you know, I think it goes back to how we kind of started this, you know, just feeling seen, feeling heard. Think about Indigenous women, even when they're not in the room with you, they're not on the Zoom call with you, um, you can still incorporate that thought into your work. Um, and if you're really struggling with how to answer that question, then pose it to your colleagues. <laughs> Ask it out loud. <laughs> what does this mean to Indigenous women? Have we thought about that in our work? Thank you so much, Miranda. Yeah, I think a, a, a few tips and tricks and, and um, just a constant reminder of uh, where we're at. Um, Brittany, you mentioned, you know, um, constructive disruption. And um, I often call myself a little bit of a disruptor because I do, you know, I enter into every conversation, every meeting with a, a, a realization and, and a, to remember that right now, things aren't working for us. For Indigenous women, it's not working, right? So how do we fix it? And so that actually means that status quo is not okay. So how do we keep asking the same question about um, how we are going to disrupt the system in a way that will make it better for us? I'm always trying to get everybody just a little bit angry. <laughs> you gotta get a little fire in your belly and, and use this as fuel. Like having these kinds of statistics in our world is not okay. We can't just be accepting of this, right? Yeah, somebody just said, I'm always enraged. I'm always just slightly enraged. And that that's good. We have to be just a little rage is good because that's what gets us to, to the change. Um, we've seen this across the country, particularly after the Kamloops. I struggle with the language around this, but our truth that we have always known is now known to everyone else, right? There's no more denying it. There's no more saying, oh, that didn't really happen, you know? No, 215 children, lost souls were found. We knew that was gonna happen someday. Abigail Echo Hawk also has a good saying around those children. I love this. I, I, I you know, as much as I grapple with the, the, the day, the, the day of reconciliation, the orange shirt day, us wearing the orange ribbons, Trying to trying to trying to figure out what do we do, what do we do to reconcile this? Um, what do we ask for? I mean, how many emails did you ladies get saying, "What do you want us to do on September 30th?" <laughs> you know, I got them too, and I feel a lot of weight and responsibility with that ask. Right, a lot of weight and responsibility with that ask, but I have to remind ourselves too that we are on a journey. And a lot of people think Indigenous cultural safety training is a, is a whoop, I took it, I'm done, I'm good. You know, not everybody thinks that way. I actually really acknowledge and admire everybody who has entered into this journey with us and who has been relentless in asking us for more and more and more information, more training, more knowledge sharing, more time with our elders. They want to learn more. We actually just can't even keep up with the requests that we get. Uh, from Vancouver Coastal Health um, colleagues and peers. We do need to um, find a way to be inclusive when we're doing our work. Um, every day, those constant reminders, how can I change a little something? How can I make things different? How can I take, as this, this session uh, implies, the leaping into self-reflection, creating ripples in your ICS journey, You'll see that this part of it is about um, the, the symbol is a frog. We started off with hummingbird. The hummingbird is your first foundational training and that was the theme of last year's virtual summit. So hummingbird is about 
getting the stories, getting the knowledge and starting and then sharing that knowledge with everyone else. So the hummingbird is our messenger and shares things with everybody. It also calls upon all its friends to come along and help. And actually the hummingbird um, myth and story is a hide a story about the little hummingbird who one drop of water in his little beak at a time was putting out an inferno, a great big forest fire. And then was calling upon all other forest animals to help with that. And that's what I think of us as, a, as hummingbirds, one drop of water at a time and the inferno being racism and healthcare. And that us as a team are trying to put this little fire out uh, one drop of water at a time, but we actually call upon all of our all of our friends, colleagues, and peers to help us put out this inferno and end racism in healthcare. Um, and so that's our journey. And it is a journey. It isn't a matter of you're going to take one course or you're going to, you know, participate in one of these summits and learn. It is a journey and it's a journey that we have to figure out how do we learn best? What's our methodology of learning? Do we listen? Do we read? Do we take classes? Do we, you know, what do we take up? And we're just asking you to just take up whatever you need. The part of training, uh, creating your own journey and our Indigenous cultural safety team has been just as much as possible trying to give as many different uh, formats of training uh, to help people with this journey and give the tools, if not the tools, at least activate something, activate some empathy, activate that, you know, a little state of um, frustration and anger, whatever you want to use to fuel yourself into the action, into the question, be curious. I always say that to be curious, ask why. It all starts with why, why do we do it this way? Why don't we do it this way? Why didn't we talk to them? Why didn't we frame it this way? So keep being curious, keep trying to disrupt. Get a little angry, it's okay. It fuels our changes. I'm just looking down at my notes again to make sure that we don't go too far off track and that we stay on time. I know we have other speakers. It's now 10.52 and we need to get to some questions and answers. So those of you that have some thoughts, you don't have to have a question. Fuel us with your thoughts. <laughs> maybe you have an idea that you've had in your work or maybe you've had an opportunity where you've looked around the room and said, why? Why haven't we done it this other way? Where do I go? I find that also one of the things as, as being an Indigenous woman health leader in our system, sometimes I find um, partners, or, or my colleagues, um, people that I work with or, or end up around a, a virtual Zoom or table with, sometimes have that question. They have, they have a question, but they don't feel comfortable enough asking it. And I think this is also one of these opportunities that we want to make you feel very welcome in asking questions. I think there's actually more harm in not asking the question. I'd rather you ask the question and, and feel a little uncomfortable for a moment, but you will never, you will never, um, uh, these aunties, this is why we call aunties, aunties are, are the the soft place to land, you can ask anything. Aunties are forgiving and caring. And um, that's what we're trying to do is just model this, this uh, approach of aunties, the approach of grandmothers, the approach of women in circle helping. Oh, I see some, some questions coming my way, but any other thoughts, Miranda or Brittany on cultural safety in particular, as this is a cultural safety um, summit, and, and about that leaping into self-reflection and creating ripples. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what you're saying, Leslie, that I think it's really important to be brave and just, you know, try it. <laughs> um, you know, Indigenous cultural safety is, is part of an ongoing lifelong learning journey and something that you have to do in relation to others. So you can't just kind of privately practice it on your own at home until you perfect it. Like you're gonna have to go out and practice it with other people. And that means you might make mistakes. You might fumble your words. You might not always know what to do. And that's completely okay. That's part of a learning process and it just takes practice. Yeah, so thank you. 
Brittany, any thoughts? Um, I was just thinking, Leslie, how you were talking about this journey that we're on. Um, and I was actually in a meeting yesterday where we were reflecting a bit back onto how far we've come in this journey over, you know, I've been doing this research work since around 2003, 2004. Um, and Leslie, you've been, you've been in this work for a long time as well. And, and we've had this conversation about, you know, the, the level of awareness that existed at that time, even, um, or lack of awareness that, you know, there weren't these conversations about land acknowledgements and acknowledging territory and that more intimate understanding of situating ourselves um, as guests on these territories. That's, you know, that's been a huge movement towards uh, embedding cultural safety in our systems um, and acknowledgement and visibility. And so, you know, I think that this Indigenous women's uh, piece that we've been talking about is emerging into visibility. And we're in that phase now um, where the issues that Indigenous women are dealing with and the ongoing colonialism is now visible. And now we're in the stage of um, figuring out how we continue to challenge what's been happening, how we work towards action in this way. Um, there's no longer a question of of what the issue is. There's no longer a need to look to collect more information necessarily on, on what is what Indigenous women are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So just reflecting back on how far we've come, we have come a long ways, we have a long ways to go, um, but it's not lost on me that we've, we've made a lot of progress and there's a lot more visibility now and these conversations are so important to happen. And I'm grateful that we're having them on a regular basis, um, and especially within the health authority. So, yeah, hands up to you, Leslie, for leading that. <laughs> oh, thanks, Brittany. It has been um, it, it has been a, a, a journey, um, and you're right. Uh, there's no there's no denying, you know, anymore either. We talked about this too, many of our meetings about um, the calls to action. Thank you for mentioning Joyce Ekashan. Um, you know, it has been one year, it's a one year anniversary, such a horrendous story. And as you mentioned, Brittany, I've been doing this for a long time, you know, it's 16 years and counting. Um, and that day of Joyce's story just broke me. It just cracked me wide open. I, I do a quite a quite a ceremony every day <laughs> with myself before you know putting on my coat of armor and coming in and doing this work because it is it's challenging, it's rewarding, and it's art <laughs> every day. Um, that day, my guard was down. <laughs> my guard was down, and I was not ready to hear that story. I was not ready to hear those headlines. And even though it did not happen in our health authority, it was not here in our own backyard, it was back east, it still was our collective health system. Our collective, like no matter what, it's like cheering for your team, right? You're, there's this collective responsibility as being in the health system um, to make things better. And that story just broke me. It was the first time I ever felt so defeated so um, hopeless. I thought, oh my gosh, like I, I can't be a part of a health system that still lets this happen. You know, Brian Sinclair's story was bad enough. And then now this, Joyce's story is right up there with Brian Sinclair's. We will never forget their names, right? Um, and that lasted for a while. It sat with me for a while. Brittany, I remember the day because you were in the office too and it's orange shirt day. And we said, dang it, we should not work on orange shirt day. It's too hard. It's a hard, hard day for us as indigenous people to work. And, and now they've made it a federal holiday. So I guess we can take it off now, but uh, that was such a difficult day. And then my daughter who is actually in the education system, she's an indigenous support worker in a, in a school in Abbotsford. She, she said, mom, I hate working on September 30th. It's the hardest day to work. 
but I know that she said this year was the first time she didn't uh, she didn't weep at work <laughs> and get emotional at work because it was more celebratory, which was quite nice. But yeah, we have been disrupting for a long time, um, and and now we're just so apparent. We're here, right? Everybody knows um, indigenous cultural safety and, and disruption of these systems is, is a priority. And we're all being called to action, right? We're all being part of it. We all have a role to play. So I think it's thrilling. Um, I can certainly feel it. I feel so absolutely supported by this leadership in Vancouver Coastal Health and the work that we have to do. Um, and we're not in it alone. That's not just us. Is everybody, everybody plays a part. Everybody is part of that ripple, right? You can't drop a rock in and not have the ripple effect. If I touch, if I dip my toes into the ocean in my, where I live, if I dip my toes in, it's the same water as Brittany's when she dips her toes in her community. It's all connected. Right. And we all play a role. Do you have something more to add, Brittany? I saw you took yourself off mute. Oh, I was just, you know, remembering that that day, Leslie, with Joyce Eshaquan and, you know, us and our team um, being so impacted by that and by those headlines. Um, and I think the thought that I remember us talking about was that you know, are we still in a day where an Indigenous woman has to video their experience to have it be validated, to have it be believed, or to seek justice? Um, and I think I've heard um, Dr. Don Wilson also say in another session, you know, how many of those weren't videoed that we don't know about? So I think that was the big, um, you know, shock for us. The big thing that that stays with us um, is that Joyce felt she had to video, um, and that's something that stays with with Indigenous women. I mean, this is what we're talking about: this collective um, connection that we all have. Like we feel that so deeply in this work. Um, and it stays with us to kind of fuel that fire, right? To ensure that we don't ever have a Joyce in our system. That's what we're working for, is to never see that happen again. Yeah, yeah. And um, a speak up culture where colleagues and peers that witness speak up on behalf of their patients as well. So that, yeah, in case, you know, they're not recording, but that you are witness, right? We, we, we have that as a cultural practice and many of you have heard us talk about being witness. When you are witness to something, it is your duty to speak up, speak up. We don't accept any bullying or racism in our healthcare. And, and it is up to us to know and understand that you will be 100% supported to speak up against it. Be their voice when they feel they can't be heard because they don't even feel seen. Right. Yes, thank you so much for bringing that uh, forward too. We do have some questions. It's probably even more since this, this uh, sheet of questions was brought in to me. Yep, here comes version two. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, I, I quickly scanned them and there is one that I just want to say, um, Dorothy, thank you for sharing. I'm going to offer you a bit more time with us individually to share because I think this is a very, very personal story that you've shared with the Q&A that requires more time and a couple more people that I think can really help with this conversation. I'm so sorry to hear what has happened to you. And I hope you are well today and that know that you are one of the women that we work on behalf of every day. 
One of the questions is, do we know what cultural practices are being taught in schools and daycares to support confidence of young girls? Wow, what a fantastic question. Um, I don't know if either Brittany or Miranda have anything to add. I will share what, what the three of us aunties just spoke about um, as we were preparing for this, this talk. We are in this stage of re reclamation, reclaiming our old ways and practices in our communities. So I think, again, speaking to under the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People to pick up and reclaim our cultural ways so that we don't leave it to schools and daycares, right? That wasn't our way. Our way was um, our, our young girls our, would go to their aunties and to their grandmothers. And I shared that I did that to my daughter. <laughs> Um, my 11 year old, I think just maybe 10 and a half going to turn 11. That was the age and uh, Miranda mentioned Auntie Ginny. So Auntie Ginny was the auntie and several other aunties, her sisters and, and cousins. And I dropped my daughter off at um, the Charlie Long house up in Stahelis where the aunties did their, did their magic and um, shared and taught Carly along with many other young girls in what we call natural changes. And they followed all of the cultural practices, the, the 5 a.m. Um, bathing in the cold river, the collecting cedar boughs to make their uh, beds, the chores and everything that happened around taking good care of the longhouse and being in ceremony and um, learning about our ways. Um, I dropped my daughter off and, and five days later came back to get her and I um, arrived, you know, we had a lovely ceremony at the end uh, where all the mothers, grandmothers and um, siblings and everybody came back. And honestly, um, I picked up a different daughter <laughs> that day uh, when I collected her five days later. And I, I, I'm a firm believer of these kinds of practices and I would love to see them restored and reclaimed. Um, lots of communities still do it. I know many of our First Nations are picking up and reclaiming these practices with our young boys and young girls. And um, it's really something I, I, I know we have baby ceremonies too, Miranda, um, when we welcome new babies into the world. So, you know, as Indigenous people of ceremony after ceremony for every different age, um, ages and stages of life. But Miranda, uh, Brittany, do you have anything more to add there? The question is, do we know what cultural practices are being taught in schools and daycares and to support confidence of young girls? Yeah, so I, I don't know about any culturally um, specific practices like teachings being shared in the schools. Um, but what I, I can say is that I've noticed from my daughter's experience, she's in grade two, um, in the first month of kindergarten, they started learning about residential schools. And that's vastly different from my experience going through school. Um, when we had like one page in grade 11 in the social studies class about residential schools, <laughs> like it, it's, it's truly, I have noticed that the school is very intentional in um, creating space for Indigenous students um, to express who they are, to proudly identify, um, to proudly share, you know, what Orange Shirt Day means to them. So um, I, I've definitely noticed that, at least at my daughter's school and in her experience, she's felt um, that it's safe to identify who she is, where she comes from, um, and like have the opportunity to share her own perspectives and teach her peers as well. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah, I, I know that in my own community, the schools have a ton of language teaching and cultural, um, cultural content for the Indigenous students from the nation, but um, in other schools, I haven't, you know, seen quite that experience. But as Miranda said, you know, the 
the way that this is being taught is so, so much better and so much different than it was um, when I went to school. Um, I was just talking with another uh, Indigenous woman leader recently about you know, that, that hot face that we used to get in elementary school when the lessons came up about the fur trade. Um, I always remember the teachers saying, you know, oh, you're First Nations, what do you think about this? <laughs> Miranda knows too. Um, and then cue the whole class turning in our direction and looking at us for our reaction on colonial history uh, in grade four, grade five. So I, you know, that has stayed with me. I remember that uh, blushing hot face uh, pressure of that moment. I don't think that happens anymore. I sure hope that doesn't happen anymore to Indigenous students. And I think, you know, we're on this journey and we've come a long way. Um, and, you know, if anything out of this uh, in Kamloops finding, it's really, it has woken people up to, um, the true impact of this history and I, I've seen the education system seems to have you know sprung into action and are teaching children at a younger age and um, incorporating this into their curriculums and into their work um, on such a deeper level than there was in the past so of course we have a long way to go but um, we have made progress in that area I believe anyways. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, I would really like to focus our energy in supporting our um, the 14 First Nations communities in Vancouver Coastal Health Region. Um, we claim, if they haven't already, uh, their own ceremonies around their, their young women. Um, certainly, aunties, all of us and, and all of the other Indigenous um, women leaders on our team um, we're, we're hopefully we're modeling, right? That's, that's another part of our work and our role is to model that we don't only have to represent the devastating data around Indigenous women. We can be on the other side of it. We can be the good outcomes of hard work, education, and, and um, journeys that take us in a different path, but model that you too can come in and work in these systems. It is safe to work in these systems. It's safe to be here. It's safe to be a part of the, the change that we're looking for as well and influence that. Bring your whole self to your work. I think that's what's exciting about the work that we do. Um, i just try to scan some of these calls. This, this question really hit home and I know Brenda Wagner's on the call and many of our senior executive team members. This question has been asked a few times. Um, are there intentions to look at integrating Indigenous birthing centers into hospitals? And boy, I know this makes Miranda's heart just go boom. Um, yes, uh, we are um, advocating, for lack of a better word right now, a little bit of a, a rethink about birthing centers as we go forward with any uh, new builds or, or renovations. I know Miranda's had the um, incredible uh, opportunity and um, privilege to work with Harmony Johnson over at Providence Healthcare as they reimagine St. Paul's Hospital. Um, so that's one, one area that maybe Miranda, you can share a little bit about. Um, I've certainly talked with uh, colleagues like um, Sean Parr and a few others about Lionsgate Hospital and uh, Brenda Wagner, I know up in Squamish Hospital is looking to, you know, bring more awareness and perhaps make space, right, for these honoring ceremonies that happen when, when babies come to our world. Um, but yeah, Miranda, any thoughts on why birthing centers are so important? Yeah, mm -hmm. my gosh, my heart does sing for this. This is my dream. And one of the reasons I've come to VCH is to try to do exactly that. Um, you know, I think it's about, uh, you know, honoring that birth has always happened on these lands since time immemorial. And I think it's um, kind of a, 
a, a paradigm shift kind of going back to that, you know, the idea that we have every right as indigenous people to birth our babies in our own homelands, um, you know, and as much as possible to bring in, um, you know, the best of the medicine that we have today. Um, and, and also be able to bring our culture and bring our families and, um, you know, bring kind of the ceremony of birth. And I think, you know, the idea of birth centers really, um, you know, kind of offers kind of the best of both worlds. I think there's, um, you know, a lot of opportunity for us to get creative about what that looks like and how to work with the local nations um, to really meet the needs of, of the community, um, better understand, you know, what, what the desire is um, for, for support um, to birth, you know, closer to home, as we say. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely uh, love that vision. Um, and I think, you know, that we have the opportunity um, you know, to be leaders and innovators in maternity care, um, you know, not just in BC, but across Canada and even the world to kind of show a different model of what birth can look like. So yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> let's do it. I agree. And uh, we have had, um, you know, particularly up in the, in the Help Sick Nation and the New Hawk Nation, um, a lovely elder by the name of Pauline Waterfall has been um, asking that same question for a number of years. Um, when can we have birth in, in our community? Um, I'll never forget, Miranda, we were actually on one of your um, perinatal substance use calls with community. And one of the, um, one of the participants said, we're only allowed to die in our community. We're not allowed to birth and I, that just stuck with me I thought oh my goodness could you imagine if you lived in a community where you weren't allowed to celebrate well not that you're not allowed to celebrate that you weren't birthing in your community um which is you know th they go hand in hand in our in our beliefs thank you for that um okay let me see if I can get to another one of these questions this one's kind of a tricky one, but let's let's ask it. How do you reconcile within yourself when you come from a mixed background, identity as indigenous but present as white? How do you educate people you that you cannot judge people by the color of their skin because you don't know how the person identifies? Oh man, this is such a good layer upon layer question. Um, a conversation that uh, my family has, my, my two children do not look Indigenous. In fact, a lot of people, no, you're not, you know, when they do identify. But one of the things that I always kind of do that, hmm, I ponder a lot, is when was it that I determined for myself to identify as Indigenous over Italian? So my mother's Italian, my father's indigenous, but when I talk about myself, I talk about myself not as Italian, but as indigenous. I mean, I introduce myself sometimes as, you know, being half, half and half, but where I feel and how I feel about who I am is 100% indigenous. And I think that, I mean, maybe it's nothing more than uh, what I've learned what appeals, what I know most about. I don't know a lot about the Tomarelli side of my family. I got to learn more about the Stolo side of my family and my connections to the land, to where I, I've been raised, where I came from. Um, but Miranda, Brittany, do you have uh, a thoughts around how do you reconcile this? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's not an easy question to to answer in, in a short period of time because it's been truly a lifetime of reflection and exploration for myself. And I remember uh, some of my earliest conversations with my dad about my identity as an Indigenous person when I was like three or four years old and, try, you know, trying to grapple with, well, what does that mean I'm Indigenous? Um, but like you, Leslie, you know, growing up in Stalo territory, um, I always felt a, a strong draw and connection to, to my Stalo roots. Um, 
in a way that I, I didn't get from my other side of the family of, you know, mixed Russian, Scottish, Welsh ancestry. There was no intentional passing on of culture or connection to those uh, ancestral roots, and, but I felt the very strong intentional passing on of your stalo. You need to know what that means. <laughs> You're going to be proud about it. <laughs> You're going to go to ceremony. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I felt that really, you know, that the importance that my dad always presented as you, you need to know who you are and where you come from, be proud of that. Um, and, you know, growing up in my village of Sawali and, and having connection to all of my aunties and uncles and cousins certainly, um, you know, helped me feel grounded in that place that I belong in that place. Um, but it's also been a, uh, you know, a, a lifelong um, journey of coming to understand what white privilege means and that I can present as right white and people don't always know that I'm indigenous, um, you know, walking alongside my sister who presents, you know, darker skin and does look native and seeing how very different um, she's treated in the world. Uh, than I've been, even though we grew up in the same household with the same parents, but have very different experiences in life. So I tried to be really mindful of the privilege that I have, both in being white passing, but also the privilege that I have as an Indigenous person who grew up on my land um, with connection to family and connection to my culture. And I try not to take those privileges lightly. Um, I try to be you know, um, just very mindful of that in, in how I conduct myself. And, and I think that um, you know, it's, it's to the credit of my aunties who, you know, stood me up when I received my traditional name and told me what it means um, to have this responsibility of carrying my name um, and of being an auntie and eventually becoming a mother. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't have a simple answer other than that it's taken, you know, a lot of, a lot of reflection and personal journey. Um, and, you know, just, just trying to honor all the parts of myself that, um, that make me me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Miranda, and why it's so important to, to also just allow people to self-identify. Like we don't, we don't need you to just be able to look at somebody and say, and think to yourself, oh yeah, she's Indigenous, or no, she's not Indigenous, right? Allow people to self-identify, and then don't question it. Oh my goodness, the stories we've had, oh, you know, <laughs> Well, you don't look. Well, that doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> oh, we do have some more questions, Brittany, but did you have any thoughts you wanted to share about this identity question? No, I think you you two aunties covered it, but um, yeah, I just I just was thinking when Miranda was talking to you about kinship systems and kinship ties and you know that's a that's part of the journey of reconciling this. That was the question about um you know, connecting, connecting to relatives and kin and, um, you know, that will really show you the way, I think. Yeah. So the, the other question about the birthing center has sparked a bit more conversation. So I'll just uh, try to skim over a couple of thoughts. Um, and we did mention that birthing and dying, they, they are the I don't want to say they're the same for us, but they're equally as important to us as Indigenous people. And making space for both is, is paramount in our world. And um, so along with birthing centers, uh, Dorothy, there is also needs to be space and place for that end of life, moving on to the spirit world. And yes, we are looking at creating and making sure that those spaces are available to our Indigenous population and patients and families in any of our locations across the health system. Um, and then Mar Miranda, you'll like this one because this one comes from Vivian Eliopoulos, our CEO who says, Miranda, I don't think we should limit to our vision to new buildings. I think we should look at all of our buildings. And of course, you're absolutely right, Vivian, we do want to, um, even, in, even in just some of the smallest ways, um, make space to support our teams who are helping our women across our health system. Um, you know, doing things like making sure that they have access to a, a little care package, a, a, a nice little gift from us to them. Uh, we've talked about the simplest of, of gifts, not a lot of cost, but can make a world of a difference for babies in their 
first little while, babies and moms is, you know, a breast pump. And so Miranda's like, yeah, I'm going to use some of my little fund over here that I got from <laughs> to make sure that there's access to things like that. Many of you know our, our us fund that we've just kicked off um, on September 23rd at the town hall. Um, that fund has been built to help our Indigenous health team help all of these CH teams in meeting unmet health care needs of our patients while in our care. So um, things like birthing and having access to some of those necessities will be really important for us to, to help uh, meet that need. Um, things like having access to a drum, a blanket um, in our birthing centers would be so important so that if the family wants to drum their baby into the world, which drum to us is the heartbeat and their heartbeat will start to come out the same as everybody else's heartbeat in the room when we drum our babies in. So things like that do, they, they change everything. They change the whole experience for the family, the mom and the baby. So we look forward to, to working with everybody on that. Um, another really good one uh, that came in, progress indeed is the comment. You and your team have moved mountains. Also, the more demand for meaningful Indigenous-led or at least informed initiatives grow, the more demands on all of you to be everywhere always. <laughs> how can we support you all? How can we support you so all this work doesn't just sit on the shoulders of your team? Well, thank you so much for acknowledging that. I really appreciate that. We are always here talking about the fact that our team may be small and, and, and mighty, and we really are here to support other teams as subject matter experts, as knowledge translation, as guides, as lived experience, as uh, cheerleaders sometimes to just help you to do your work. Sometimes we just have to have quick interventions, quick catch-ups, um, maybe a check with us how things are going. We provide a little bit of guidance and then you go off on your own. We are not here to do all the work. We know that. There's no way we can do all the work. We count on uh, creating allies in our system to help us with this work. We're here to help you with your work. Your success is our success. That's the way I look at it. Um, so we're trying to engineer a team within Vancouver Coastal Health that is um, specialized in that we have expertise in all these different areas to help advise you in your work. Thank you for acknowledging that. Um, we don't mind helping with a boost up. Uh, we don't want you to stand on our shoulders. That will, that will hurt. It won't will, will be sustainable. So it is about how do we help you learn as much as possible. Another person asked about, uh, you, you spoke a bit about hummingbird, but what, what's, the, what's the frog all about? <laughs> well, frog, um, frog is really about uh, transformation. The frog um, transforms and once it transforms, it leaps, it leaps into action. So that's really why we chose frog as stage two to go hummingbird, frog, salmon, eagle. So our whole Indigenous cultural safety program is built on these four, um, you can call them pillars. A lot of things happen in fours in our culture, uh, four seasons. We have uh, lots of areas where we have um, four days as part of the ceremonies for, for our cultural practices. So our four stages of Indigenous cultural safety starts with hummingbird, where you are, learning the stories and sharing the stories. Frog, where you go and you are, are starting to transform yourself into an ally and you are taking the knowledge you've learned and you are leaping into action. So it's like bystander to ally. Uh, for those of you who know that the, the Sanus program in, in PHSA, salmon, salmon is where you're actually like really transforming, swimming upstream. You are against the current, you have to work extra hard at pushing back against the system and, and disrupting. So the salmon is the next one. By the time you reach Eagle, 
uh, eagle, you're soaring. You have a you have a very high level view of everything that is going on, and you can see where your efforts will make a clear difference uh, with your eagle eye and uh, your soaring with your competencies as you've grown throughout your journey, and you are fully practicing cultural safety in everything that you do. So that's our intention is to have all of our staff go through our four levels, soar, but keep going on that journey. And sometimes I think in, in these journeys, you start again at the beginning and go through it again. <laughs> and you just keep practicing until you have absolute mastery. And uh, mastery is something that um, you learn over time, something that you begin to pick up and use as second nature. You don't think about it too much, right? So that's what we're hoping for. I know we have so many more questions on here. Um, another one is, where is a good place to start for someone who is the beginning of this journey? Any course recommendations, novels, books, podcasts? Yes, yes, yes. There are so many resources uh, available to you um, through our Vancouver Coastal Health Internet. Um, our ICS team will always flash the, um, the internet page. Please go to it. Um, dig around in there until you find what suits you. There are book recommendations. There's a book club that this um, team has started. There's other summits, there's other opportunities to learn all throughout the year. The aunties, these three and other aunties that we'll bring on um, over this next year, will resume our talks again. We've had lots of inquiries, but when are the aunties coming back? We did take a little bit of a hiatus. It did get a little heavy there for a little while after after the Kamloops um, Indian Residential School story started coming out and, and the ripple effect of all of that, and then the demand of our time and, and addressing, um, again, the racism in healthcare, the Mary Ellen Triple LaFond report, which we do every day. And Indigenous cultural safety is, as we said, a journey. It's your journey. You need to learn the way you need to learn what works for you. Find it. We made it available, or if we haven't, certainly. Our lovely friend Google has lots of answers for you as well. Another question that I just want to answer before we finish off as we wrap up the first part of our, um, our discussion. Oh, Avanti's asking me to do something about Slido. Sorry, I think you're all going to get a Slido. Please log on to Slido to complete the following evaluation, which can be found when you enter 544649. Please do that if you have time and while you transition to the next session. As somebody had written about wanting to go to a ceremony, wanting to go to something on the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation at the former St. Paul's Residential School near my home, but as a settler, would that have been appropriate? Um, I, I believe it was the Slaywood Tooth Nation that did a march from their community to that school. I know Brittany participated, her and her family. Um, when our communities put something like that together that's very public facing, you are more than welcome to join in. Anytime you see anything happening in public areas as a, as a um, settler, which is a word I, I'm not too keen on, but a lot of people use it. Um, you are more than welcome to go and join that. Our, our, our friends and families in this territory and our visitors from other nations across Turtle Island, when we are performing or welcoming or in parks or anywhere where we are public facing, that is, that is your signal to join. That is actually there for you. It's not there for us. When we're doing our ceremonies, we're going to be in our longhouses and our big houses. We won't be outside, out and about. So you are more than welcome um, to join that. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that's a wrap for us. Uh, again, I really want to thank uh, Miranda and Brittany and our whole ICS team under the leadership of Janice Wardrobe, our Director of Indigenous Cultural Safety, our beautiful elders that started, oh, somebody's asked what's a better word for than settler. I don't know. I am going to give some good hard thinking about that. I don't know if Brittany and Miranda have an idea, but the settlers were somebody long ago that came on the shores. I, I, I just don't, 
I don't know. I, I, I feel like it's such an old word. Um, I know some people have used uninvited guests. Sometimes I think that is okay. Visitor, guests, anything that acknowledges that you aren't the original occupants of this land, right, is, is really what we're trying to get to when, when we're saying, can you please identify where you come from or who you are? Um, if you're not from these lands, you're not indigenous from this land, you have come from somewhere else. So really it's about identifying who you are and where you come from. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us in this talk. Certainly hope that you're able to stay with us for the next few hours. We've got lots of great things in store for you. Uh, some amazing keynote speakers um, today and tomorrow, some more entertainment. As I understand, uh, really looking forward to it. These questions that we have here, we will certainly get you answers to. Um, thanks again. Please do the evaluation on Slido. Uh, be well, take good care, be brave, be curious, speak up. Uh, welcome to welcome to our work, and thank you for joining us.